You've already read the title, so you know what this is going to be about. It's about that time I opened up about the game again. I wasn't joking when I said I'd want to revisit it again at a later date. A really cool thing about The Last of Us is that people often have very different interpretations of the events that transpired, and it leads to interesting discussions. As you should know at this point, I am somebody who absolutely despises The Last of Us Part 2. Part of that disgust is because there is evidently a lot of good in that game. Hell, I think some of the cutscenes are actually flawless, as I'll be using a couple of them to back up my statements. Similar to the lifting the burden video, I'm not making this one to change your mind or to clear some sort of moral high ground. I just want to, of course, present my view of things in what is apparently a wildly debated topic. It's also important to understand that this is a hill that I will die on. I am fiercely stubborn when it comes to this specific discussion. I believe Joel is a hero, a good guy through and through not morally gray, I view the Firefly Hospital as a very black and white scenario, despite people often saying that it's a morally gray situation where ultimately Joel makes the objectively wrong decision. Matter of fact, the reason I'm going to talk about this is because I see that statement said by both sides of the fan base, which I find fascinating. Haters and defenders often agree that Joel was wrong in the grand scheme of things, where we differ usually comes down to if he deserved what happened to him. Is there anything else I'm missing? Ah, uh, yes. Another reason why I'm going to indulge in this particular slaw is because this game has really helped me in the art of debating. See, something I like about being on the more Republican side of this game's fan base is that we use facts and evidence to support our claims, such as Joel and Tommy acting wildly out of character in the moments leading up to Joel's demise. Democrats, and Neil Druckmann himself, have tried bringing up points that explain the actions of the characters, but it all boils down to character assassination when you look at the evidence provided. You essentially have to accept things as Humans make mistakes. Life isn't fair. It's these elementary school statements that make me renounce the sequel game's canon. But for the sake of this rap, we will acknowledge its canon. So, the arguments I'll be addressing are the common viewpoints regarding Joel's decision at the end of The Last of Us, his motivations, and the outcome of it all. Now, before you say I'm seven years too late on this, hear me out, because I have some things from the second game to make my case. Oftentimes in conversations regarding Joel's fate and how Ellie turned out, I see fingers being pointed at Joel, with him being considered a villain to some. He apparently doomed humanity for his own selfish desire of having a child again and did the wrong thing in both saving her and then lying to her, while also dooming humanity in the process. I, like, quarterly agree with the statement of him lying being wrong, and I fully disagree with the other two. To me, Joel's actions were selfless, not selfish. He didn't doom humanity, and he made the right decision from a moral and legal standpoint. However, I won't talk about the legal standpoint of things. Starting off with my favorite bit to dismantle. Joel was selfish. To me, this is factually wrong, given what we see in the second game. Now, prior to the second game, I can actually see this being a very valid interpretation, even though it's not completely true. However, there are a few scenes that happened in part one that can be used to argue against this. I hope you can hear my dog walking around in the background. And there are a couple of scenes in part two that completely contradict that assessment. After we get to stare at giraffes, there's a cutscene that plays out in which Joel tells Ellie, We don't have to do this. You know that, right? She asks, Well, what's the other option? Go back to Tommy's. Just be done with this whole damn thing. He tries to remind Ellie that even after all of this, she is still in control. He reminds her of her agency in all of this. You know, and then she gives her the, it can't be for nothing. So what does he do? He presses onward. This is her mission. Well, I ain't leaving without you. So let's go wrap this up. It speaks for itself. Joel's not in control here. Ellie is steering the ship. When Joel wakes up in the hospital and realizes what Marlene is telling him, he tells her, Find someone else. Now see, this does seem pretty selfish. Find somebody besides your precious Ellie? <laughs> Sheesh, Joel. Do you want to go golfing? Jokes aside, I think that statement is pretty damning evidence of his mindset in that situation. You know, you're not taking her from me. They continue their chat. He asks her why she's letting this happen. She says there is no other choice. And he says, yeah, you keep telling yourself that bull. A fitting choice of words for a delusional woman. You know the rest. <laughs> they crossed the Grim Reaper, and Joel administered sweet justice in that hospital. But there is one last exchange between him and Marlene. Marlene says some pretty nasty stuff about rape and clickers, and Joel says, That ain't for you to decide. That's gosh darn right, Mr. Joel Miller. You see, there are some lines we can't cross. We don't kill children for the greater good. Because remember when Joel experienced that 20 years ago? Yeah. Killing Sarah didn't stop the world's collapse. 
Killing Ellie wouldn't restore it either. Clean that up. Let's keep using what the first game gave us, though. We have one more crucial moment. The hilltop overlooking Jackson. Right before they walk up to the gate, Ellie tells Joel about her survivor's guilt. And she tells him how, I'm still waiting for my turn. Damn. <laughs> That's some pretty heavy-hitting stuff. So, now we learn that Ellie was bordering on suicidal for this cause. She felt that her life would have been a way to make all the people who died to the infection worth it. You know, it can't be for nothing. So upon hearing this, Joel responds to her by saying, Ellie... None of that is on you. She says, no, you don't understand. So he responds, I struggled for a long time with surviving. And you, no matter what, you keep finding something to fight for. Joel knows exactly what Ellie is going through. He experienced that same feeling 20 odd years ago when his own daughter died in his arms and he couldn't do a single thing to save her. He tries to get her to understand that life is more than just her immunity. Ellie is more than just a vaccine. Joel was the only person in that hospital who fought for Ellie's right as a human. Also, how was he acting selfishly in that hospital? By risking his life and limb to save hers? Isn't that selfless instead of selfish? Maybe my understanding of the words is tainted or something, or something just isn't adding up. What would have actually made it selfish would be if he woke up, asked about them guns from a year ago, and then had no qualms with Marlene telling him that they were going to have to kill Ellie for the vaccine. So once again, let's clean this up. He wasn't selfish. Was he rescuing Ellie so she could help him shoot his way out of the hospital? You already know the answer to that question. But he just wanted another daughter figure in his life. Once again, this is factually wrong when we look at the evidence provided. Now yes, The Last of Us is a game that shows a father-daughter bond between two strangers, and it's beautiful, really. However, there are these people that have this really disturbing take on Joel. They think Joel has some strange attachment to Ellie and views her as a replacement for Sarah. I remember reading a comment that some dude left about Joel's line to Ellie about him and Sarah used to take, being used to take, uh, taking hikes in woods similar to the ones that they were walking through on their way to Jackson. And he described that line as haunting. See, Joel cares for Ellie like a dad would his own child, and vice versa for Ellie. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me, I have not hydrated for this. Let's not forget the ranch scene, where Ellie brought up Joel's late daughter. So, to push my narrative that Joel wasn't a delusional weirdo who had just abducted a red-headed kiddo, I've already referred to the Jackson scene, but the best one is yet to come. It appears in Part 2! At the end of The Last of Us Part 2... <laughs> When Ellie returns to an empty farmhouse, she has a flashback to the last conversation she ever had with Joel. This is my favorite cutscene in the game, as it is a perfect showcase of Joel's character, and it also completely shuts down the arguments against him regarding him being selfish and just seeking another chance at being a dad. So, Ellie is venting her frustrations at him. She goes so far as to say, I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have mattered, but you took that from me. Some more heavy-hitting stuff. <laughs> Poor, ungrateful, spoiled brat child Ellie. <laughs> Disregarding my heavy disdain for Ellie in this scene, Joel takes a pause and responds to her with the best line in the entire game. If somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. Jesus Christ, man. This line is a big part of why I hate that game so much. Because how can you have a line that is so consistent, so true to character, and so powerful in execution, and then have that 30-hour dumpster fire of a game before it? Anyways, back to the analysis. So even after Joel was outed from Ellie's life for the better part of two years, and she openly said that she wants nothing to do with him anymore, Joel admits that regardless of their outcome, he will always choose her life over a vaccine. What else can I say? Joel didn't do it for him. He wanted to actually give her a life worth living. Everything that Joel did in that journey, in that hospital, and afterwards, was for the benefit of Ellie. He wanted to relieve her of any guilt she may have felt for things that were out of her control. He did everything in his power to give her a life worth meaning. They even lived separately in Jackson, with his house overlooking hers. He taught her how to swim, play guitar, all of her survival skills she picked up from Joel. He remembered her birthday. When she said she was done with him, did Joel ever fight back? No, he gave her the space she demanded and never came crawling back, but still watched over her, even defending her from Seth, 
then he stood by his actions in fighting for her life. Even if she personally felt that it was wrong, Joel will always fight for his loved ones. If he couldn't do it for Sarah, he'll definitely do it for Ellie. Now, people may feel as though, even after all of this irrefutable evidence, <laughs> they still have a checkmate. His lie. Aha. If he's so right and justified and not selfish, why would he lie to her? Well, let's get into interpretations and the outcome, shall we? So, there is no definite answer to Joel's lie. That is completely up to each and every person's own, uh, every person's headcanon. So, here's mine. Considering all the context clues from part one and part two, I believe Joel doubled down on his lie in order to shield Ellie from any guilt and to take the burden of his actions. He lied to protect her, knowing that the truth would be too painful to bear. So, lo and behold, when Ellie discovers the truth, she's devastated, because she believes her fate was sealed at that hospital. Do not forget that Ellie was suicidal, and I will never condone a suicidal person, let alone a child. Joel knew that the fallout would ensue when she knew the truth at that point, which is why he doesn't fight back, but still stands by his decision. So, I believe I haven't missed anything regarding the selfish daughter-seeking Joel, so I have done my best to provide evidence to argue in the defense of Joel, the best dad in gaming, who unfortunately committed himself to an ungrateful kid. If you can't tell, I've always liked Joel a lot more than Ellie, no offense to her. <laughs> and part two just further cemented my unconditional love for the man. You know, I'm just a sucker for a strong father figure in my games. I've used evidence from both games to support my statements, and if you disagree and still view him as selfish, well, you're wrong, and you can go eat a cone of yeast. <laughs> Moving on to the next point, Joel doomed humanity. This is trash. Once again, I will be using evidence from both games to support the idea that Joel didn't doom humanity. Joel made the correct decision in the hospital, the fireflies were wrong, and he didn't doom the planet. So in order to understand this viewpoint of mine, we need to look at the whole dilemma of sacrificing the few to save the many. You know, the whole for the greater good argument. Mind you, I'm also saying this while completely acknowledging that the vaccine had a 100% chance of success. I bring this up because many people talk about the whole, you know, real-life fungal diseases don't have a vaccine with modern medicine, and, I mean, come on. It's a video game. We can have some lapses in, in logic. Let's do better, because there's actual evidence to argue against this. So let's begin. So, what The Last of Us showed me was that humanity was not worth Ellie's life. If you got to the end of the game and felt conflicted and even angry at Joel for what he did, you need to be locked in a straitjacket and sent to the loony bin because you have completely ignored the world building up to that point. You have disrespected the characters you played with and as. You are a husk of a human being, similar to Abigail Anderson. Do you remember Sarah, Joel's kid? Not only was it sad in the sense that she died in her dad's arms, but in that moment, Sarah died for nothing. The soldier followed orders at stopping the spread of the infection, to not let anybody out of Aust uh, Austin. You know, sacrifice the few to save the many. So, after the soldier kills Sarah, what happens? We see that 20 years later, the world is destroyed. Wow, Sarah literally died for nothing. Joel experienced the outcome of this moral dilemma. Him and his daughter were about to both die for nothing, and Joel ended up living to see the end result. So, in less than 20 minutes into this universe, we can see that this humanity is very hard to care for. Strange. It's almost like the game was about two characters in particular. What is our first interaction with the Fireflies? An act of terrorism. They blow up a truck at the Boston QZ and risk the lives of innocent civilians to disrupt the military. Do they have noble ambitions? Yeah. But they've crossed the line numerous times. They have endangered the lives of innocent civilians. They recruit child soldiers. We, we can see that with Riley. They then try to dismantle the military, who's trying to keep a sense of order within the devastated world. So... We get out of Boston, and at some point later, we enter a new part of the world, Pittsburgh. And oh, what a lovely place Pittsburgh is. So what happens when the military is overpowered? A lawless land where the inhabitants pillage and murder tourists for petty things like sneakers. What lovely people worth a sweet 14-year-old child's life. So once again, the game is showing us that this world is harsh and un- <clears throat> Hell yeah, is harsh and unforgiving, and we have to fight our way out of this defunct city with Henry and Sam as our allies. Henry and Sam act as a very good parallel to Joel and Ellie, particularly in their outcome. We see that without Sam, Henry feels as though he has nothing left to live for, and he kills himself, not even a minute after putting down his own brother. Think back to Joel's quote, No matter what, you keep finding something to fight for. Unfortunately, Henry wasn't strong enough to continue without his brother, because was life really worth living without Sam? Hint, hint! 
Fast forward some, and we discover Tommy's small outpost near Jackson. This is where Joel and Ellie's relationship solidifies, and just before we leave for the university, we get an overlook of Jackson. Big, powerful walls. Kids will be watching movies tonight. Something worth fighting for. Something worth living for. Continuing a bit with the winter section, I, and I mean, just talk about a true showcase of humanity, David and his group of cannibals. If there is ever a part in The Last of Us that shows the harsh nature of the world, look no further than the winter chapter. Now, I don't want to scan over everything we see, but long story short, in the winter section, we see a depraved community that has resorted to eating other people when food is scarce. Their leader is a vile human who has sexual interests with a 14-year-old girl. It is also here that we get to see what is undoubtedly the most traumatizing and life-changing moment in Ellie's life, her escape from David. Ellie now has seen humanity at its absolute worst point. And maybe if this dang infection didn't happen, the outcome of somebody like David could have been avoided, yeah? You know, maybe we should get a game that has his backstory, because apparently this is a world of greys, where there are no rights and no wrongs. <laughs> Complete drivel. Now, we're in spring. We finally found the hospital. What do we know of the fireflies at this point? We know that they aren't above terrorism. They have been reduced to a very small group, as they have been slaughtered by those such as the military and ragtag groups like the Hunters of Pittsburgh. We've seen a hilarious level of incompetence, where around every corner we see dead fireflies. At the university, we learn that they were testing the cordyceps and its effects on monkeys, leading to one of their researchers being bitten by an infected and caged animal, <laughs> to which he killed himself before turning. So the fireflies are anything but dependable. However, maybe we can make all this right with Ellie's immunity. Immunity. So, how do we finally meet up with the Fireflies? Ellie has just drowned and Joel is trying to resuscitate her. Their response? KO him and abduct the two. However, this isn't the turning point. It's what we learn in Joel's chat with Marlene. So to quickly rehash their chat, Joel is denied seeing Ellie. Marlene tells him that she's been prepped for surgery and that the doctors can use her immunity to make a vaccine at the cost of her life. Joel tries to argue against this, and Marlene tells him that there is no choice in the matter. There is no other choice here. And she dismisses him. March him out of here. If he tries anything, shoot him. All right. So we've just been shanked in the back by the fireflies. At no point was it indicated that Ellie would have to die for this, and so they have abducted her and are playing God with this child's life. Now, for all the people that argue against Joel's actions, I have a question. What right did the Fireflies have to kill Ellie? What? Her simply being born is immune? Oh, sorry, Ellie. <laughs> you just happen to be born this way. You gotta die now. <laughs> Screw off. Honestly. People also like to say, well, Joel didn't give her a choice either. R wrong. R wrong. R wrong. <laughs> he reminded her that she was in control and went along with the mission. The Fireflies took away her agency, and Joel saved her life. He didn't make the decision for her. The Fireflies did. Remember, facts don't care about your feelings, and those are the facts of the situation. Oh, and a bit more information to support my claim of the Fireflies being nothing but backstabbing, terrorist, child-murdering buttholes, Marlene has two recorders that Joel can find in the hospital. In one of them, she's talking with Ellie's already deceased mother, Anna, who is trying to justify her she's trying to justify her actions to her too little too late and in the other recorder recorder marlene mentions that the firefly suggested killing joel <laughs> wow so joel's reward for giving them what they asked for a year later would have been to kill him and the person that he brought <laughs> jesus christ now of course marlene stopped this as she hoped that joel would see things the way she did which was her biggest mistake remember joel was promised weapons a year earlier for a job done he did what they asked for, and their response was to march him out at gunpoint with none of his gear or the weapons he was promised. Likely to be shot dead once he, met, once he made it outside, even though being left out in the world with nothing was a death sentence in and of itself. Facts don't care about your feelings. The facts of the matter was that Joel was betrayed by the Fireflies and sentenced to death by them. They were trying to play God for both Joel and Ellie's life. So as we know, Joel was completely justified in his actions at the hospital. He killed backstabbing, fanatic, child-murdering terrorists. Now, let's analyze real quick the only three canon kills Joel has at the Firefly Hospital. Ethan, the doctor, and Marlene. Ethan. He followed Marlene's orders of marching Joel out at gunpoint, itching at the chance of shooting him. Remember, just give me an excuse. While marching him out with a gun at his back, Joel gets the upper hand and executes him after getting information on where, Ju on where Ellie is. Where's the operating room? Justified murder. The doctor. After reaching the hospital room to retrieve Ellie, Joel enters the room and the doctor responds, 
What are you doing in here? He runs to retrieve his scalpel. He points it at Joel and tells him, I won't let you take her. This is our future. Think of all the lives we'll save. Don't come any closer. I mean it. So the doctor denies Joel the right to take Ellie to safety and threatens him with a surgical tool. Once again, justified murder. So let's touch up on Marlene. Marlene sentenced both him and Ellie, or sorry, sentenced him and Ellie to death. Later confronts Joel as he carries an unconscious Ellie. She th- at gunpoint. She then pers- she then tries persuading him into doing what she believes is the right thing. So Joel defends both his and Ellie's life by capping Marlene. Before he finishes her off, she then pleads for her life. No, you don't just get to play God for Ellie and then beg for your own life like a coward justified and morally right murder and even if joel did kill the entire hospital worth of fireflies which personally when i played that's what i did i killed all of them he was completely justified in doing so now after all of that corn hash has been laid out i didn't even touch on how he didn't doom humanity because that's what the second game answers for me Isn't that just beautiful irony? For the game that tries its absolute hardest at painting Joel in the wrong, it actually supports his actions and shows that he did the right thing. Part 2 is a revenge plot in which human beings cause every bad thing to happen. We are now 25 years into the apocalypse, only 5 years after the events of the first game. Jackson is a thriving community that reminds us of what we should be fighting for, while in other parts of the country, there are factions at war with one another, and people who have resorted to slavery, which is quite literally regressing humanity. So I'll ask, how many characters in Part 2 died due to the infection? A grand total of one, which was Nora. Nora. And that one barely had anything to do with the infection. Literally every single death that happens in Part 2 is a result of humans being trash. Joel dies, Abby mad, sorry, Joel dies because Abby mad, Abby smash. All of Abby's friends die because she was too dumb to finish the job. So in reality, it's Abby who gets all her friends killed. Don't forget character motivations. Joel was interested in saving a young girl's life. Jerry and Abby were interested in taking that life away for a hopeless cause. The infection is put on the back burner, as everybody has more or less adapted to the world at this point. Best scene with Jackson, a shining example of how humanity has a chance to be what it once was decades after the cordyceps ravaged the world. Friendly reminder that a vaccine is not the same as a cure. A vaccine means that you can breathe spores, but will still get eaten alive by clickers if they get the chance. A cure means that you can be a clicker and then become a human again. So from the evidence the second game provides me with, a vaccine would have done absolutely nothing to change the order of events of the world. Incredible. And you're still going to tell me that Joel doomed humanity? Really. Matter of fact, am I supposed to believe that Ellie giving her life for a vaccine would have just slowly stopped people from being trash? A vaccine is going to stop the hunters in Pittsburgh? A vaccine is going to end the feud between the WLF and the Scars? Uh, what? David and his group of cannibals are worthy of a vaccine? Sorry, let me angle the camera correctly. I'm hard, it's I'm holding it with one hand while reading this. It's difficult. Yeah, get that trash out of here. The infection was ap- has absolutely nothing to do with the crappy behavior of these abhorrent groups of human filth. Once again, Jackson exists in the exact same world as those other groups. And apparently Jackson is so cozy that people can concern themselves with the same gender kissing one another. <laughs> My lord, that second game sucks so much. For the people that tote the sequel for being so grounded in reality and true to the harsh nature of life, they sure buy into this childish delusion that Ellie's death would have just saved the planet, which is nothing short of comedy. Now, I know what some crackheads are going to say. Well, if they made a vaccine, Riley, Tess, and Sam wouldn't have died. Likely true. Here's the thing about Ellie. Ellie is a very altruistic person. She even risks her own life when Henry and Sam ran off from the truck in Pittsburgh and put herself in a very dangerous situation. Ellie's curse is that she has deluded herself via her survivor's guilt and believes that giving her life for a vaccine will stop other people like those she's known from getting hurt. As we have seen from the game, this is factually wrong because who is really hurting people 20 years down the line into into the collapse of the world? Something that can't be cured or vaccinated humanity that's sorry 
That's why Ellie will put his life on. That's why Joel will put his life on the line to preserve the life of others, while Ellie was committed to giving herself up for the sake of the world. From the evidence that the game gives me, Ellie would have died for nothing. Was Ellie noble for wanting her her life to be given for a vaccine? Yes, but we and Joel know that the end result would have been yet another meaningless death, and Ellie finally understands that and learns to forgive him when it's all too late, as we see with the end of the freaking fan fiction sequel with her forgiving Joel. Ellie is somebody who doesn't want to see other people get hurt and deeply cares about others. She was unfortunately crippled by the traumatic experiences in her life, and Joel was her savior in more than just the literal sense of saving her life. Joel also saved her from herself. Big ups, Joel. Last name Miller, who lives down at Jackson, come back and restock with us. <laughs> Every death can be blamed on Joel. That's a lovely quote I, I've read. That is nothing but a pathetic and childish delusion to which you have lied to yourself and you believe that Ellie would have instantly restored society with her sacrifice. Get the heck out of here with that trash. So, using what the games gave me, that is my bulwark defense of Joel Miller, the unquestionable hero of The Last of Us, the man who did no wrong but was chastised by all, except his brother. Who got him killed? <laughs> uh, the man who didn't doom humanity. The man who wasn't selfish. And the man who didn't get what he deserved. Joel did nothing wrong. Ellie sucks in part two. And there was no sequel. Thank you for listening.